morning. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Gorgeous day outside. <laughs> Fill the room with some gorgeous excitement and energy. Welcome to Bloom in the Desert Ministries. Um, my name is Chuck Wilhelm, <coughs> not Kevin Johnson. Um, and he would be glad that I made that distinction. <laughs> he will be back next week, I believe. So, uh, you know, come, come again. Um, we're going to light this candle this morning to represent the presence of God in our midst. And when we leave this morning, we take that light with us into the world. <coughs> we're going to try to light this candle. <laughs> Have it upside down. Have it upside down? <coughs> oh, okay. Bingo! Sometimes the light of God is hard to find. <laughs> well, welcome. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey and your faith journey, you are certainly welcome here at Bloom in the Desert. Whether you're gay, straight, bisexual, or transgender, We'd love to have you call this home. So welcome, and, and uh, we're so glad you're here this morning. Good morning. Please rise as you are able and join me in the reading of the responsive call to worship, and the congregation will read the word in full. I hear your voice. I hear your sound. It is wisdom calling. Where is she? Where can I find her? She calls from the depths of the heavens and speaks with the truth on her lips. May I come? May I learn? Yes, you may come. You may learn. Wisdom calls people, all people, to faith, peace, love, and hope. Here we are. Waiting upon and welcoming the Spirit of God who calls us into life. Shalom, salam, hang on, pause, peace, amen. Now is the time to pray and open ourselves to the loving embrace of God. Now in prayer we welcome God's spiritual embrace. Together we say, We thank you, Lord. That you give us love and peace through Jesus. That you offer us the key to all spiritual knowledge through your Holy Spirit. For those who are in the midst of life's problems, grant your wisdom and insight from love. For those who are burdened with anxiety and fear, offer your wise assurance in times of need. For those facing decisions about family or career, bless them, bless them with your wisdom on high. For those entering a new chapter in their lives, be it the birth of children, taking new jobs, finding a place to live, or entering retirement, guide them on the proper path and bless them with a sense of peace. This we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. Amen. 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 Let us now receive the word. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's Hebrew scripture reading comes to us from Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Now, since we have been made right in God's sight by our faith, we are at peace with God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us to the grace in which we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to the day on which we will become all that God has intended. But not only that, we even rejoice in our afflictions. We know that affliction produces perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and character, hope. And such a hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. 
here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. John chapter 16 verses 12 through 15 I have much more to tell you but you cannot bear to hear it now when the spirit of truth comes she will guide you into all truth she will not speak on her own initiative rather she will speak only what she hears and she will announce to you things that are yet to come in doing this the Spirit will give glory to me, for she will take what is mine and reveal it to you. Everything that Abba God has belongs to me. This is why I said that the Spirit will take what is mine and reveal it to you. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Seating pastors always seem to be away when it's Pentecost, Trinity Sunday, or the scripture is bloody and ugly. And here we are at Trinity Sunday, and Kevin is not here today. Although it is the first time in four years I have not preached on Pentecost Sunday, so good for him. 
I see one of my very best friends is here this morning from the Unitarian Church, and I let him know this morning that this was probably not the Sunday he should, he should come. <laughs> because he's going to hear a lot more about God and Jesus in 11 minutes than he's heard, than he hears in months at a time at the Unitarian Church. But it's always good to look out and see his face. He did remind me, though, this is going to give away who it is at some point in time, that he wore a shirt with fish all over it this morning. So, so there is a connection to us Christians who are Christocentric. Every year on the church calendar, Trinity Sunday is celebrated the week after Pentecost. On Christmas, we talk about the birth of Jesus. On Easter, we talk about the resurrection. On Pentecost, we talk about the Holy Spirit. And on Trinity Sunday, we talk about all three, the Trinity. We have this special Sunday because the doctrine of the Trinity is essential to our Christian faith. Some people think that our faith is simply a lovely story about a man from Nazareth named Jesus whose life is without equal. Some people think that our Christian faith is primarily about a God who created the universe and who expects us to care for God's creation. Others think that Christianity is a series of ethical and social precepts which will guide our journey, and yet others think of the Christian faith as a countercultural road to peace and nonviolence. To me, it's all of those things and more. Today, I invite you to think about your Christian faith as more than a faith that expects you to act, more than a faith that encourages you to feel and love and show love and other emotions. I want you to think of your faith today as a faith that demands that you use your mind use your mind, not lose your mind. Use your imagination today and wrestle with the implications of what you discover as we examine the concept of the Trinity. Think of today's sermon as an encouragement to see the world as God does, on a large canvas or a big screen, as together we discover the big picture about God. As Christians, we believe in the Trinity, God is parent, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit. The parent, the all-knowing, all-wise creator, is our God. Jesus is the Son of God, the one who walked on earth with us. And the Holy Spirit's presence with us now is also a piece of our God. The word Trinity comes from two Latin words, tri meaning three, and unity mean one. Thus the Trinity means three and one. One of the best-known hymns of the church is Holy, 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 a hymn written by Reginald Heber in 1826, which declares at the end of the first and last verses, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a blessed doctrine as it gives balance to our understanding of God. The creeds of the church, such as the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the United Church of Christ's Statement of Faith, and the new creed from the United Church of Canada all declare a belief in the triune God. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but it's a term reasonably used to describe the reality of God the Creator, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit proclaimed to us from the pages of the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches that God is one substance, that God is one being, but that there are three distinct God's uh, distinctions in God's personhood. We must be careful and wise in understanding this doctrine. We don't worship three gods, but one God, revealed to us in three different ways. Jesus uses the imagery of the Trinity repeatedly during his earthly ministry. You might remember Jesus' final command to his disciples from the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus commissioned the disciples by saying, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In our sermon text from John 16, we hear him declare that all that the God has is mine. Many people affirm that God is the creator of the world and that, that the God of the universe is all-powerful and all-knowing. Many people easily affirm that God is spirit 
that mysterious power that infuses our lives, <laughs> that the Spirit is the force that pours God's love into our hearts. But there are some people who struggle when in our creeds, in our songs, and in our prayers, we boldly declare that this Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is indeed God. In Romans 5.1, read this morning, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus brings us closer to God, but how close is Jesus to God? The most often question asked about the Trinity is this, was Jesus really God? Across my years in the ministry, I've heard a number of people declare to me, I can believe in Jesus as a great teacher, a wonderful moral example, but I can't believe that Jesus was God. It's hard to know where to start when someone makes that kind of declaration. We can begin by looking at the specialness of Jesus' birth, his miracles, the healings, the resurrection, and the words of Jesus that he and God are one. I think that the real problem for those who do not believe that Jesus is God lies not with Jesus, but with many folks' concept of God. The problem is that people think we already know what God looks like. Often they look at God as a distant God, somewhere out there, who set the world in motion, but who stays at a distance. Up there somewhere, far removed from the grunt and grind of the world. We may get occasional glimpse of this distant being, this uninvolved God, but many people believe that God is like the clockmaker who sets the pendulum in motion and sits back and watches the world tick and talk. Back at the start of the century, Bette Midler had a popular song on the charts titled From a Distance, which reinforces this view of God. The Christian church takes another view. The church has always taught that we would not know, that we could not know God until we meet God in Jesus. Those who have trouble seeing how Jesus could be God say the Savior was too involved in humanity to meet their standard of an aloof and distant God. When they look at Jesus, they see the one who was birthed by Mary, who suffered and who died on a cross. How could God ever enter the human body? Why would God want to? If you understand the God we meet in the Hebrew Scriptures, you understand why God would come to earth. The God we meet in the Hebrew Scriptures is an involved God, a merciful God, a God who at the beginning of the world hovers over the waters like a dove, a God who broods over darkness, and a God who brings forth light to our world. This God makes human beings in God's image, which means that in a profound way, we resemble God. The God of the Old Testament resembles us and we resemble God when it comes to our passions. God cares enough to get angry. When there is injustice, God cares enough to intervene in history. In Isaiah 52.10, we read that the Lord has bared his holy arm which is the Bible's way of saying, God rolled up God's sleeves and got involved in the world. That's the kind of God the people of Israel worshipped and expected. Throughout their history, the Hebrew people have yearned for even a greater role for God in the world, as they yearn for the coming of a deliverer, a Messiah. What if God loved this world and the people of this world so much that God would come to earth and walk in human form. What would that God look like? That God would look a great deal like Jesus of Nazareth. This Jesus was not a remote, distant, inaccessible person. This Palestinian peasant drank wine, fashioned furniture, touched the untouchables, agonized over the plight of outcasts, told mind-bending parables, stood up to the authorities and was finally executed on a cross. This Jesus was God. Christians believe that Jesus was God from the day of his birth, that Jesus was God incarnate, equally divine and equally human at the very same moment. To say that Jesus is God 
is to, uh, to us that God cares enough to come to us in human form and to make the way of the cross into the way of life. The God who sent patriarchs and matriarchs, prophets and martyrs, also came and walked among us in the person of Jesus. What, did, what God did in Jesus is the ultimate act in what God has always done, that is to care, to reach out, and to love. I'm sure many of you have seen Victor Hugo's great, but very difficult to read, classic novel, Les Miserables, turned into a powerful movie musical. It just happens to be my favorite musical of all time. But, yeah, it's part of the genes. <laughs> In the movie, we meet a little girl who's named Cosette, an orphan struggling alone in the darkness under a crushing burden. Jean Valjean, a man who has served 19 years in prison for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his sister's children, has made a promise to Cosette's mother, Fantine, to try to help raise her daughter. Now in the darkness of a terrible night, Cosette is relieved of her heavy burden. She looks up in the shadows to see the kind and gentle face of Jean Valjean the man who has made a commitment to never forsake her. Suddenly, she realizes that he's been there, walked beside her, and she hasn't been aware of it. Sometimes this happens to us with God. We think that we are all alone on the journey. And then suddenly we realize that the one who comes to us as creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit is there for each of us, each step of the journey. Trinity Sunday is a day for us to look at the big picture, the biggest picture that we can imagine in our minds. When we think about God, we should think about the one who brings us a timeless presence, a timeless love, a timeless consistency. As Isaac Watts says in the old favorite hymn from 1719, O oh God, our help in ages past, based on Psalm number 90. Before the world in order stood or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, through endless years the same. Such a big picture of God nearly defies imagination, and yet it allows us to have a big picture of our universe. The Trinity is the church's attempt to paint the big picture of God and to have us expand our minds to the point that we see all of the picture. In many churches, confirmands confess a faith in the triune God. We baptize in the name of the Creator, the Christ and Holy Spirit. At funerals, we commend our brother or sister to the God we know in three ways as Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. We are bound to the concept of the Trinity because it helps us explain the unexplainable, and because it undergirds a big picture of life in this universe. This day, may we experience the fullness, the wholeness, and the unity of God. May we live life in the care of the one who was, who is, and is to be, the God who is creator, the redeemer, and the sanctifier. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We offer our gifts to God, who claims us as children, who names us beloved, who celebrates our presence. We offer our gifts to a loving God, Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.